Support for the Lancast is provided by Winding Way Books, Ryan Hess, and Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Welcome to the Lancast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Becky Spenson. On this episode of the Lancast, we hear from Jason Mundock and Steve Carlson about their production of 24 Hour Plays. The gentlemen tell us about the planning process for making six plays from start to finish in 24 hours. I, I kind of think of it as, as creative chaos. I mean, you're really, you're taking uh, roughly 35 people and giving them some parameters, you know, to work with and some limitations, but a space to do it and just throwing it in, you know, throwing them all in this big pot and stirring it up and saying, let's see what comes out the other side of it. And you're going to do it in front of, you know, 100 people. We also take some time to dig into Steve and Jason's backgrounds. Uh, after I graduated from college, I didn't want to get a real job, so I headed to Japan and taught English, and I enjoyed it. I came back and got my teacher certificate, and so that's what I've been doing. It's a good way you were it back. I didn't want to get a real job, so I started teaching. No, I, I went to Japan. You know, there, at the time, you know, early 90s, a lot of people were going to Japan. It was the economy there was strong, and so a lot of people who didn't want to stay around, it was a good good adventure to go over there it was easy to get jobs and then a lot of people were brought to teaching through that enjoy the conversation well steve jason thank you for joining us thanks for having us maybe you can tell us a little bit more about 24 hour plays go ahead well the 24 hour um, plays have been happening in new york city probably around 15 years it started kind of as a grassroots uh, project a bunch of friends getting around and and thought of the idea and, and went for it and since then it's been uh, produced all over the planet, and uh, we decided to pick it up here. I heard about it 10 years ago from a friend of mine who was involved early on in the project, Susan Mitchell, and um, it kind of percolated for about 10 years, and uh, then I approached Jason to see what he thought about it, and thought it was a pretty good idea, and so here we are. Yeah, I mean, the whole the whole idea of, of um, I'll just kind of lay, the, lay out the, the way it works, uh, if you're not familiar with it, and that is... We essentially have six writers, six directors, about 20 actors, and some crew. And then Steve and myself and my wife Suzanne are, are producing. So we're basically running around making sure that people are where they're supposed to be. Uh, and in a 24-hour period, we literally start with nothing. And the writers write six short plays, roughly 10 minutes. Um, they write that through the night, and then the directors and actors come in the morning there's a there's a welcome meeting the night before right so th- say friday night um around eight o'clock everybody who's involved meets and the um the actors introduce themselves and talk about what they can do and then the writers have to pick those whatever actors they want to use because you know you're writing a play but you 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 have a limited um you have a limited set of people that you can pick from that you can write for uh, so you don't want to be writing for, you know, two teenage boys if you have an elderly woman and a, you know, a child or whatever, you know. Uh, there won't be any kids in this one, though. Uh, there will be some, some high school kids. But, uh, so in the morning, the, uh, the actors come back and the directors then figure out which play they want to work with. And then they literally have that day to, to learn the parts, to figure out all the technical stuff, lighting and staging and props. And, uh, showtime is seven o'clock. Saturday night, the next night. So it's it's within a 24-hour period that these plays are written, rehearsed, and then performed. And the hope is that, you know, since the writers haven't seen the actors before, they don't know who they're writing for, is that it'll be purely something that's coming up at that moment. Um, so since they don't know how many actors they're going to get, who it is, if it is a high school kid and an older woman, that they'll not have something in their minds before they show up on the evening. I know one of the most common questions that I've heard when speaking about 24-hour plays is why. Well, I, you know, I'm not an actor, and this is my first foray into, into theater, but the whole idea of getting so many people together to produce something in 24-hour period is just exciting. Um, I can organize, I can motivate, and I can put things together. So I'm just looking forward to getting all this creativity together and just seeing what happens. I think that's the big draw. Everybody we've talked to is really excited about it. The all the way from the directors, the writers, the actors. Like once you explain the concept, they're right there because they can see that this is going to be something that's going to challenge them, but could also produce something that's that's pretty magical. You know, it's, the whole idea isn't to really isn't on the production side like this final production. It's the process really um, and experiencing that process. And I think everybody can see that. Yeah, you know, it's I, I kind of think of it as, as creative chaos. 
I mean, you're really, you're taking roughly 35 people and giving them some parameters, you know, to work with and some limitations, but a space to do it and just throwing it in, you know, throwing them all in this big pot and stirring it up and saying, let's see what comes out the other side of it. And you're going to do it in front of, you know, a hundred people, uh, hopefully. So it's, the, it's just the sheer excitement for me. And I'm not, I don't come from the theater world either. So when Steve approached me about this, I thought, wow, what a, what a great, just sort of crazy thing to take on and see if we can pull it off really. And I, I've been fascinated by all the great stuff that uh, creative works has been doing as far as experimental theater uh, in this town. And, and I thought we can, we can certainly contribute to that. Um, and, you know, just give people yet another option to, to see some experimental theater. Yeah. I mean, speaking of creative works, I mean, Lydia Brubaker over at creative works is a, is someone who comes from, a background in theater and she's been instrumental you know connecting us with some of the right people and and really helping us out um and supporting us all yeah absolutely as we, do this. we couldn't have, we couldn't have gotten where we are right no now way. without lydia no no doubt so right now steve you had the idea and then you came to jason who has the woodstove house which is a, a company that puts on production right right and then you've got creative works involved is there anyone else that's kind of put their hand into this not from the not from the production side um, you know, we've done house concerts for a couple of years and we helped organize some other events in the area. So it was kind of a natural, you know, connection. And Steve and I have been friends for a few years. So it was like, yeah, we've, you know, we've put things together and gotten people to, to buy tickets and things like that. So we have some experience, at least just, you know, putting on some kind of performance. Um, and we immediately, of course, when we started to really organize this, reached out to Creative Works because, um, I've talked to, with Lydia and Chet Williamson and some of the other folks over there for years about their vision as they're growing it. And part of that vision was always expressed as, you know, if somebody has an idea uh, and wants to wants to try to pull it off, but but there are some missing pieces uh, and there are some things there, there. If there are gaps that we can fill, uh, then we want to be an organization that can help fill those gaps. And so I immediately thought of them and went we went to Lydia uh, and Chet and said, here's what we've got in mind. We're not saying here you guys should do this. We're saying we, you know, we want to do it, but we need your help. And it was a perfect match. Uh, so they've been supporting us with recruiting some of the players. They've been uh, instrumental in helping us get set up to sell tickets, uh, which are on sale now. They've just been uh, they've been really helpful with promotion. And and you know now that we're only three three weeks away, less than three weeks away, we're going to be working with them to to sort of do the blitz and, and get people get people involved with buying tickets and getting ready for the show. I would I would like to say though too that um, you know Brian McKee, who works over at Shoemaker Designs, he's going to be the stage guy. So he's really handling a lot of the staging um, for us and setting up lights and all that kind of stuff. And you know we approached him and he was excited about it. And we said, hey, you know, can you handle all this staging for us? And he was all over that. Um, and then Rod Shoemaker over at Shoemaker Designs is you know helping us a little bit with with some of the staging and the lights and things like that over there. So you know Brian. On the production of that 24-hour period, he's going to be, he's going to be a major, yeah, definitely a major guy. I mean, as far as the technical production, I didn't mean to leave Brian, right. up, but yeah, as far as technical production goes, Brian stepped up and he's organizing the crew. Um, we've scoped out the space for lighting and for staging and for curtains and all the stuff that we're going to need. So, from an organizational perspective, it's Stephen and, and myself, my wife Suzanne and and Lydia, really kind of uh, trying to pull those pieces together, but. But Brian's just, you know, I'm really excited to see what he comes up with. And then we've got a, a growing list of local sponsors who are, who are really chipping in because you know, we've got to essentially take care of 30 plus people for 24 hours. Got to make sure they've got what they need as far as, you know, food and make sure they're comfortable and they have an environment, a space within the work, you know, a space to, to let this creativity happen. Our job primarily for those 24 hours is to remove obstacles from the people who are actually being creative, you know? So we got to make sure that, that, that nobody runs into any walls because you, you know, the clock's ticking. And if a writer's stuck at 4 AM and needs something to break through that, we are responsible for making sure that they've got whatever they need. Um, so it's, it's really, it's a lot of people, you know, it's a lot of different moving parts at this point who are kind of pulling it together. As I hear you describe this, this sounds like something that, would be really exciting to participate in. I'm not an actor and I really am not comfortable acting, but this makes me want to be an actor or maybe to write or to be a part of that process. How would this kind of performance be different for the audience uh, from a, a more conventional one act? What stands out 
as a different element in your experience as someone who's watching this happen? I think we're going to find out. I don't know. I don't know if we can. I don't know. If you can even say. I mean, ho- we're. I think we're collectively hoping that that the audience is aware of. And again, this is our job, but that the audience is aware of the the creative chaos that came together to make this happen. So, you know, when you go to the Fulton or when you go to to a, a professional theater or when you go to a, a creative works production, for example, that's been written and and uh, directed and rehearsed for several weeks and then it's put on, right? If you're going to a play, you have a certain expectation that you know this that this play that people have rehearsed and that they've had ample time to get this right. Uh, in this case, you know, we're really um, it, it could. There's six opportunities to <laughs> to hit a home run, and there's six opportunities to sort of fall off a cliff. So, and and it's not just on one person. Because the writer literally is done at six in the morning. Like they're free to go home and go to sleep and hopefully they'll come back and watch it. You know what I mean? They, but they don't have to be, participate in that creative process. So you're handing, it's like you're tagging off right to the director and then the director's tagging, working with these actors and the lights have to work and everything has to work. So I think I'm hoping that if we can convey to the audience that what has just transpired since eight o'clock the night before that that they'll see this performance in a different way, almost like the difference between improv and improv, you know, um, performance versus a staged, a staged play. There's a difference there, right? You have a different expectation if you know it's improv. Well, this is sort of kind of mashed up in the middle of those two things. I mean, we were, we were going over the production schedule yesterday and, you know, 24 hours at first seemed like quite a long time actually to me. And then we were looking at the schedule and it's, it's tight. Like each, play is only going to get an hour on the stage to rehearse in addition to some of the time that they'll get other places. But I think once they're, once they feel like they're prepared, once they're done rehearsing all that, I don't think that kind of that energy, that kind of nervous, Oh geez, like here we go. Kind of energy is going to stop until I don't know, nine that, o'clock that, that night, night <laughs> or the next day or something. So I think if there's a difference um, and I'm sure on opening night and all that, there's like a lot of energy in the house with the actors and whatnot, but this night, I think there's going to be, it's just going to be a pumped up space. And maybe the audience will be able to feel feel that and be a part of that. Mm-hmm. You're putting on six separate shows here, basically. And how long do you expect that to take? Or how long will the production be? About 10 minutes, we think, per, per show. And then there'll be time to set up, or if there's any change um, in sets, the sets are going to be really minimal, so it shouldn't take that long. Hour and a half. For the whole the whole thing from introduction, you know, Jason's going to say a few things at the beginning to get things going and explain to everybody what's going on and give a shout out to our sponsors, and then um, we'll go from there. So we're thinking we'll be done at you know eight thirty, start at seven. Yeah, and we also have uh, we have some music uh, that's going to be performed uh, in between the shows. Uh, an improv artist who's going to be providing some, you know, hopefully very interesting music to kind of bridge the gap. Uh, but the music will be live; it'll be performed right there in the space. So yeah, I'm thinking it. I'm thinking 90 minutes. Yeah. And we're hoping too th- from the space, like the space, well, you know, in that it's that warehouse, first floor um, space in the candy factory. It'll have a little bit of an edge to it, but you know, Brian and his crew are going to make it look really good. It's yeah. going to be a good. I mean, he's good looking. Space he's planning there. to transform it, you know, into something that it's not. Like I, I don't know if I've ever been in there where it's been set up quite like he's he's envisioning right now. Um, so it should be. It should be like walking into a completely different place than you've been before, even if you've been there for various events in the past. Yeah, I'm curious to to see what it will look like. Candy Factory is an awesome space. How many people do you think you'll be able to fit in with the context of what you're trying to do there? We're we're looking at a hundred, so we have a that's that's what our capacity is, um, and we it's going to be intimate if if we get a hundred people. You know, I mean, you'll you'll get to know your neighbor, but you'll have a you know you don't have to sit on anybody's lap or anything, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the number we're shooting for. Now that doesn't include, um, that doesn't include everybody who's participating in the event. Um, so we're, we're planning space backstage kind of space and space where people can, can move in and out of that, that doesn't uh, interfere with, um, with the, the actual audience, you know? This is a great time of year to do something like that because if there's one thing that building's known for is heating up. 
<laughs> so it's nice that it'll be nice and cold and the heat yeah. will be beneficial. Yeah, right. The, the human heat. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to head to break and we come back. We'll have more with Steve and Jason. Hey, everybody. We're here at Penn Cinema to find out what everyone's been talking about. Excuse me. Why do you choose Penn Cinema? I like the seats. They're really comfy. <laughs> They're a lot nicer than most other places. Even my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this place is great. I mean, it's popcorn. We've got some, uh, we got a slushy machine over there. Found some, we got three clocks. Three clocks for the Lidditz, the Lancaster, and the effort of time, just in case, you know, you don't know what time it is in your area. That's why I love this place. They, they, they think about everybody, you know, very friendly. Has a nicer environment. It's clean and comfortable. It feels independent. You know, like it doesn't feel like part of a system. Like it feels like as big as it is and as polished as it is that it feels independent, you know? Bigger screen, better quality. So it's really close, it's very clean. We come here all the time. What do you like about Penn Cinema? The seats are my favorite thing. Very comfortable on the rump. <laughs> 3D IMAX, the whole shebang. It has a down home feel and we love the atmosphere that Penn has created. He really tries to take into account what people want in a theater. It's really clean and the seats are really comfy. <laughs> yeah, I like the seats. It's the best movie theater to come to. Well, you've heard what they have to say. Now come see for yourself. Check out Penn Cinema for first-class movies in a first-rate theater. Located at 541 Airport Road in Lidditz, PA. So, Steve, how does someone get into putting on a 24-hour play? You know, after hearing about it from my friend um, 10 years ago or whatnot, it just sat there and I just wanted to do it. It sounded like a really great, you know, just a awesome thing to do a wonderful experience and so it just sat there and sat there and sat there and then finally i bought the license and i knew that if i bought a license or spent any kind of money on this thing then that would be um kind of the inspiration to do it um, and that's when i talked to jason but um yeah i mean i've kind of been you know we've had interesting parties and done different events at our house but nothing quite like this would you call yourself an actor, a writer, a director? I've been been writing. I you know started out st tor uh, telling stories to four year olds and as a preschool teacher, mm -hmm. and then finally have been writing some of those down and and exploring that currently with a group in Lancaster, the Lancaster Writing Group, um, and it's been a great experience. You know, something to keep me accountable, joining the group and writing stories and and seeing where it goes. So you said you're not necessarily something involved in plays or theatrics what is it that you you do i teach seventh and eighth grade so th we do a lot of uh kind of different things in the classroom a lot of you know we may produce movies produce short skits produce plays produce dramatic stuff as part of our curriculum and so you know i've seen how how cool it is to see middle school kids do it um and enjoy theater and and um, thought that it'd be fun, something fun to do. You mentioned having to acquire a license. How long is that license good for? Or is it just you do it and then you can? It's good for six months. And I bought it more than six months ago. But we, since we hadn't done our play yet, you know, they worked with us and and we they extended our license. And the license essentially allows us to use promotional materials. We could, of course, do a, something like this without the license. But it just felt good to pay the pay the money it's not that much money that we bought the license for and then we, we got some materials from them, some support materials and some advice and things like that from them. there's a hotline an emergency <laughs> number that we can call does that um, count during the yeah, 24 we can hours call. like we, we can, can <laughs> we can be like uh we just had a total emergency like a I don't total know if meltdown she wants us to call at 3 a.m though or something <laughs> so you mentioned that you do a lot of acting with your uh, students, can you maybe just share a moment or or a student um, that gives us a snapshot of just a really beautiful moment that you've been able to have in that context? Um, well, this morning we were the kids were um, doing skits to dramatize the different theories as to why we became bipedal, <laughs> and one of them, awesome. one of the reasons was to attract a mate. And, it's valid. It's valid. And the two students, it's like a guitar, you know. The stu two students approached it. They had kind of a conversation 
oh, yeah, you know, did you hear this? Yeah, I heard that, and da-da-da-da-da, and oh, that's really cool. And at the end, the one student asked the other student out for coffee. <laughs> so I don't even know if they realized that one was asking the other one out for a date and their topic was, you know, this attract a mate thing. But I don't know if it was a beautiful moment, <laughs> but it was, you know, it's fairly indicative of what we've had some, some really brilliant students. One is actually working with Jason in a project, Phoebe Radcliffe. Um, she, wonderful actor, her sister was involved in the piece I just mentioned this morning, um, from this morning, but just really creative kids. Like once you, I mean, let's face it, not every kid wants to write um, the reason why we became, we started Walk on Two Legs, but they'd much rather do this, you know, this one-off kind of um, theater production. And um, it's been a, you know, it's, they enjoy it, I enjoy it, and it, you know, some of the information soaks in, but um, at the end of the day, it's just, it's just good fun. And a former student's acting in the 24-hour plays as well. Yeah, Tuck Ryan is acting. Um yeah. In the production, there you know, New School in Lancaster has several connections um, to the play. We've got our de- development directors acting. Um, we've got the grandmother of a student and a mother of a of a um, staff member, myself. Um, several people from the New School are involved. We've got one of the sponsors is our head of school. Um, so they're you know want to support the arts in in town and join it in different levels in this project. Did you always want to teach, or is this just something that you kind of grew into? Uh, after I graduated from college, I didn't want to get a real job, so I headed to Japan and taught English, and I enjoyed it. Then came back and got my teacher certificate, and so that's what I've been doing. It was a good way you worded that, because you're, you're always, I didn't want to get a real job, so I started teaching. No, I, went, I went to Japan. You know, there, at the time, you know, early 90s, a lot of people were going to Japan. It was, the economy there was strong, and so a lot of people who didn't want to stay around, it was a good good adventure to go over there it was easy to get jobs and then a lot of people were brought to teaching through that um have some friends that are still like myself still teaching we're going to switch things over to you for a little bit jason uh how did you get the wood stove house to where it is where it can assist steve well uh, the wood stove house really started um about two and a half years ago when we, when we started doing house concerts uh, and that, that whole idea was just, um, based on some experiences that my wife and I had in, when we lived in Nashville, Tennessee, where we would go to parties and rather than there being these, you know, bands at parties like you, you know, like sort of t- stereotypical, uh, house parties with loud bands, there were, there would be songwriters and they would be sort of sitting in the corner and everyone would be paying attention. And so, uh, in the late nineties, um, I don't know exactly when it started, but but a real movement started. Uh, the internet really helped fuel that, and and this network of house concerts started up around the country. And we we were always really intrigued by that. Um, so when we finally had a house that was big enough to accommodate uh, about thirty people, we started doing these house concerts. And um, we did um, we would do them every few months. You know, we would host one, and we were hosting touring bands. And so that became that became a um, sort of a thing we we became known for with a certain with certain number of people and from that um a f- good friend of mine suggested that hey if you have these touring artists coming through to perform at your house and you have a recording studio in your house why don't you interview them and and do a podcast and at the time i was like why would i want to do a podcast you know um but it made sense and i i interviewed a couple of these bands and i really really enjoyed doing it so that kind of pushed things a little further because i could interview bands a lot more frequently than i could um host them to, to play a concert in the house and so i started this podcast called around the wood stove a couple years ago and uh and that's sort of grown and from that i just I, it was all sort of music oriented but i i have always taken an interest in the performing arts sort of beyond just music um i don't i don't participate in performing arts outside of music dance or theater uh, but i but i enjoy it and so i really wanted to i really wanted to break into that sort of thing um and when Steve approached me about this project, I just thought it was a really, really good match for some of the things we had done and some of the contacts that we had made. And I thought, what the heck? You know, let's see if we can make it work. And so, yeah, it's just been it's just been sort of growing out from this original seed of a of having concerts in the house. Now, for those listening uh, who might not be aware, you are pretty close to us. You've you've guest hosted and you've been on to talk about 
the podcast, and we've been on your podcast. Absolutely. Um, so you're no no stranger to us. But uh, there's one thing that we have never talked to you about, and that would be your music in playing with Fire in the Glen. Oh yeah, I guess I guess we haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, about uh, four years ago. Um, the house that I mentioned before that we moved into to have house concerts just so happened to be across the street from Tom Knapp, who was the fiddler in this Irish band called Fire in the Glen. It was a duo at the time. And, um, to just to, just to show how connected Lancaster is, um, Tom's partner at the time was Chet Williamson, who of course is, um, a pivotal member of the creative works of Lancaster, who we approached about doing this play. Uh, or this uh, this play event with. So Tom and Chet were playing, and, and I was having these parties. Uh, this was sort of pre-house concert. We would just have these parties, and we were trying different different things out, and Tom would come over. Him and his wife would come over as ne- as neighbors. Um, and so when Chet decided to step out of Fire in the Glen and move on to do to do more theater, which he has done, um, Tom asked if I wanted to, you know, to join the band, and I said, yeah, sure. Uh, he basically said, you've got six weeks to learn you know, two or three hours of Irish music because it was middle of January and March was right around the corner, which, of course, is the season, you know, for Irish music. So, uh, yeah, so I did it. I, it was back in 2008. Um, joined the band and uh, started working with him. And then uh, last year we actually expanded out to a trio. We added Aaron Gagne and uh, Aaron singing and playing hand percussion. And I play guitar in the band and Tom plays fiddle. So it's been a lot of fun. We've I've had a really a wonderful opportunity to play a lot of venues in central Pennsylvania as a result of that and record some music with Tom and just really explore this, this Irish traditional Irish music, which is just, it's really a lot of fun. And just another side note for our listeners, uh, Tom Knapp was a previous guest who talked about, uh, writing for the Lancaster paper as well as, uh, Celtic music. And Aaron Gagne was on the podcast to talk about when he was in the band Karis. And Chet Williamson has been on several times, so you can find all of them in our guest list on the website. You can learn more about them there. Jason, what is your favorite part about performing music? I would say, uh, I would say it's the reciprocal energy that you, if you, if you've got the right audience in the right situation, and that that is not a, a sure thing. But uh, when you find yourself in that particular place with with a really good crowd, and you can start to the energy starts to grow between you as a result of what's happening in the room. That's got to be by far the most powerful thing about it. Makes it just a tremendous amount of fun. What is the podcast equivalent of that kind of energy? Or what's your favorite part of having a podcast? Oh, the the podcast? Um, well, the podcast has been a way to really connect with, with musicians from outside the area. I mean, we have local... Uh, local bands or regional bands on the podcast as as we you know as we can schedule them in but but what i've really liked what what i really tried to do with the podcast was get, give an opportunity for for bands who are coming through the area a way to introduce their music to people in in lancaster and you know podcasts while can be focused on a particular geographical area um they can be heard by anyone in the world right so so it's it's sort of like i i wanted to make sure that lancaster was part of the podcast. So I've never interviewed anybody that I wasn't sitting across the table from in Lancaster. That's so that's the connection, right? So if a band is from say New York City, uh even though they may be they may be introduced to somebody who who lives in California as a result of this podcast, I still wanted Lancaster, Pennsylvania to be the reason that that happened and and their presence in town. So so it's it's been um it's been a really great experience to to sit down with these bands who come through uh, and are just coming through for the night or maybe two nights. They're playing a couple shows and then they're heading off into the sunset, you know, to be able to sit down with them and really dig into what they're doing and find out what their creative process is. And then as a result of that, really grow a network because a lot of reference, a lot of bands who contact me now contact me because somebody somewhere else said, Hey, if you're going to be in that area, you should check this out. Um, so meeting people, meeting these bands and, and, you know, growing that network and just finding all this music that I never would have found has just been the, the best part of that, clearly. If our listeners want to learn more about 24-Hour Plays, where can they go to find out? Uh, they can go to the Woodstove House website. So that's woodstovehouse.com. Um, there is a special page, woodstovehouse.com slash 24-Hour Plays. But if you just go to woodstovehouse.com, there's a big logo in the top left corner they can click on to get to that page. And, and from there, there are links to Creative Works, 
Um, there are uh, links to the original 24-hour plays uh, group in New York, uh, where we get the source materials from. Um, but that's you know that's the place to go. You can buy tickets through that website, uh, or you can ju- just go straight to creative uh, Lancaster.org Creative Works site. There's a link there as well. Um, and I'd also like to to shout out to our sponsors who have have um, uh, pledged to support financially you know this event so it can help us can help it happen. Steve, do you want to talk about this? Yeah. Um our sponsors have come forward and they've all, you know, just like when we approached our actors and directors and, and writers, they've been really behind this project with fi- finances or with um, product donations. Chestnut Hill Cafe, Lemon Street Market, Two Dudes Painting Company in town here, Sala Thai, Thai Restaurant. Dr. Matthew D. Friedman is a dentist up on Duke Street. Mary Kay and Lenny Williams. Um, Mary Kay is the head of where I work at the New School of Lancaster. And we'd like to thank uh, folks over at the Candy Factory for for having us over there, and Shoemaker Design, Rod Shoemaker over there. Yeah, everybody that we've had to you know that we've had to touch with you know to to work this out has just been great. I mean, guys at Shoemaker and the Candy Factory has been really cool about the space and being really flexible, letting us get in there and measure stuff and you know check breakers and that sort of thing. So everyone's just been super cooperative. It's been a, it's been a real joy. Now, when this episode releases, it will be the week of the play. What is the date and the time? So the 24 hours is first Friday, November 4th through November 5th. So the show time is November 5th, Saturday night at 7 o'clock at the Candy Factory. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. We hope you've been enjoying the Lancast. This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Lauren Slesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically liked this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you would like to help support us in that way, you can visit thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So, for The Lancast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Becky Svensson. Asking, are you in the cast? <laughs>